Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. No choice but get on mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. I love that about you. Jimmy Vaughn in studio. Legendary blues rock guitarist Jimmy Vaughn. Of course, uh, older brother Stevie Ray Vaughn, in, uh, who passed tragically in uh, 1990. God, I watched a doc, uh, Brothers in Blues. Was very younger good. brother. I'm the oldest. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're the older brother. Yeah. To uh, Stevie Ray, um, God, I was watching the doc last night, and uh, it's available, by the way, uh, wherever you stream and you can download it. All the platforms. It's very informative. It really captures a moment in in history, and um, really cool people in it too. Yeah, Clapton. Yeah, Jackson, Jackson Brown, Brown, Billy Gibbons, of course. Uh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, everyone's paths crossed back then. I I forgot. Oh, I didn't forget. I never knew that your brother played the guitar lick with Bowie and Let's Dance. And when you hear it now, you go, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, whenever that was number one forever and ever. Mm-hmm. Let's Dance. Yeah, he was on that. And I didn't know you were in the Fabulous Thunderbirds or formed it. yeah. Original memory. How about that? I felt I felt stupid because uh, "Wrap It Up" is one of my favorite songs of that uh, era from the uh, Fabulous Thunderbirds. I was actually watching the video last night back when people used to do <laughs> videos and be yeah, on MTV. Yeah. Uh, old Sam and Dave song, I believe. Wrap it up, baby. Who's uh, who's? It's, it's a it's an interesting song to do a redo on. Whose idea was that? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Really remember whose idea it was, but uh, well, why don't you take credit for I'll it? Take, yeah, that's a great idea, I'll take Jimmy. It. <laughs> yeah, one of your best ideas is uh, and Chris said he didn't know the song, but he knows the song. I, I tell people, <laughs> that's what, Adam well, always I, does this. I spend my whole life going, you know, wrap it up, and they go, no, nah, I don't know it, and I go, you know it, and then they go, no, nah, I don't know it, and I go, you, you'll know it, and then we play the song, and then they go, oh, this one. You want Sam and Dave or the Fab T Birds? <laughs> we'll do the Fab T Birds so Chris can be <laughs> embarrassed. Steve Cropper from uh, the guitar player for Stax. Who he wrote, was? Uh, he wrote almost all. Oh, of was also the Blues Brothers. Or was oh that yeah, a different yeah. Cropper? Later on, yeah. Yeah. So it, I, it was. You guys were going through this whole history in the dock, and I remember seeing your brother. Boy, this is gonna. I don't even know if I should admit this, but I'm from North Hollywood. You know, we didn't have a sound. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> we don't, there's no North Hollywood sound. No San Fernando Va- Valley sound. And I didn't know a ton about uh, you and your brother and that sound, but I loved John Hyatt. And uh-huh. and your brother was playing the Hollywood Bowl, I think, and John Hyatt was opening for him. So I was like, well, I'll just go watch John Hyatt, and then I'll stick around and check out this uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan guy. And he turned out to be absolutely amazing i mean playing the guitar behind his head the whole whole thing uh but you guys grew up with an alcoholic dad and grew up in poverty and it's real like it it feels like it's 200 when you see the old pictures it feels like it was 200 years ago yeah not 60 years ago or whatever it was yeah well i mean um my dad was uh he loved music and uh, he just had a little problem with honky tonking. Mm-hmm. He would go uh, on Fridays and get his check and go. And but uh, he always encouraged us to play. He always encouraged. He would take me in his pickup truck when I was too young to get in to the club in the summer, and we'd play six nights a week. I say we, me and my band. Uh, they got us a gig six nights a week. Uh, it was before they had two o'clock closing hours, mm-hmm. so it was nine. It was eight to twelve, and then uh, to mid uh, one o'clock on Saturdays in Texas. And your dad went out and bought, you, got you your first guitar, and then oh, went yeah. out and got he your first a, electric guitar. Oh yeah, That's, he was. We we found out later that he was actually a piano player. He was like a closet piano player, mm. and he loved jazz and uh all that stuff uh and my mother was a big hillbilly fan she liked uh, hank thompson and all that stuff 
yeah, but I was, my dad, you know, he liked big band. He was a they were dancers. So, but what'd your dad do for a living? He was an asbestos worker, pipe cover. <laughs> oh man! So, so he could have got in on some of these lawsuits now with mesothelioma or whatever yeah, everyone's doing he was now. Too, he was too early. <laughs> was he around long enough to see what his sons did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was real proud of us and. Uh, you know, uh, my dad was one of those guys that uh, they signed him up early. He was too young to World War II. He mm-hmm. was on the USS Saratoga. Wow. And uh, so w- we kind of ran away from home, too, and did whatever we wanted. So you know, what, what year did your dad pass? Uh, four years before Stevie, so 86. Uh, Oh, okay. Believe. Yeah, in the in the doc, there's a very harrowing story about uh, you calling your mom to tell her about what happened to Stevie. Yeah, because it was on the anniversary of your dad's death. Right? Yeah, that was that was terrible. She thought I was calling to tell her I was thinking about you today or something like that, and uh, I had to tell her that her baby child was dead. Mm. So. Um, but I, there's two things I always think about with parents. Um, I always, it breaks my heart when, you know, somebody won Super Bowl MVP, but their dad passed two years earlier or something like that. I, I like it when the dads are around long enough to see the success. Uh, but in this way, your dad was around long enough to see the success, but he passed before Stevie passed. So he didn't have to right. experience that. Right. Same day, though. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so my brother dies on the same day that my father died. So so that has to mean something. I mean, uh, whoever they are, they picked that day so that we would, I think they picked that day so that they would know that they were together. Mm. Are you a religious person? Yeah. I guess so. Uh, did um, so growing up, how you grew up, you never had a regular job, right? I mean, it was always. Oh, uh, I, had, this a, day, I had a. Right? I had a couple of, uh, you know, like I would sell cokes at the football game and stuff like that. But like when you were a kid, right? I was a garbage man for <laughs> a, after uh, my daughter was born, my big daughter, and they were all like. You're not a guitar player. You don't have a gig. All right. And so I said, well, I'll go down to the city. And I got a job uh, as a uh, sanitation engineer. Mm-hmm. And so I called my father and told him, I got a job today. And he goes, what did you get? And I said, a sanitation engineer. And he laughed. Because you know. <laughs> that meant garbage man. Yes. <laughs> so... It still does. <laughs> you're, 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 you, you had it in your blood, even if your dad was sort of closeted about it, the music, right? Oh, yeah. My dad was totally behind it, and he would take us. He would take me to the gig and sit back there with the other three dads, you know, watching their kids. We were too – I was too young to get in so to the club. So in the summertime, he would – they would get us a gig, and we got we had a gig at the Hobnob Lounge, um, six nights a week. And was there money? And we were getting yeah, we made like a, you know one hundred and fifty dollars a week, the the whole band, yeah. and we sang through the jukebox, like we had a they had a PA plug <laughs> into the jukebox. So the jukebox yeah, speaker was, the was your PA. Yeah. Jesus, I, I know. I, like I said, you see the pictures, you hear the stories, and it feels like it was several hundred years ago. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like you know. All, you know, all the people who are in the dock are doing interviews, and they were there then, and they're here now. It just seems like it's generations yeah. ago in a completely, completely they, different world. They loved it. They were like, oh, "Okay, mom, I have to take the kids tonight. It's my turn." I had to take the darn kids tonight to the honky-tonk, you know. 
But they wanted to go. <laughs> but they couldn't wait to get down there. How uh, apparent, I know your brother played, I mean, he was 14, I think, when he did his, I think there's a story in there, Stephen Tobolowsky, yeah. you know, the actor. Ned Ryerson. From uh, Groundhog, Groundhog Day. Day. You've seen the guy around, was in the band, and it was telling the story where he brought your brother in at 14, and and he just... <laughs> They said, let him play the guitar lick. And uh, they were recording, and the band was yeah. like, this guy's 14, and he just tore it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, I started playing. Uh, I got a guitar, and uh, my uncles play guitar. My, my dad's, my mother's brothers play guitar, and they like Merle Travis and all that stuff. And... Uh, and on my father's side, his his cousin played in a band. So there was a lot of musicians around, and uh, they would play dominoes on Saturday nights. And, uh, like, people would come by. You know, like, I remember some of Bob Will's band came, come by on uh, Saturday night, and they were playing dominoes. And, you know, I get my guitar. Hey, Jim, go get your guitar. <laughs> and show the guys what you can do. So I had like three, four strings. How, oh, how old were you? Um, Thirteen. Mm. So the- and Stevie started playing. Like I would put my guitar down and say, "Don't fool with my guitar, or I'll kill you." And he would pick it up and play. How many years younger was he? Four. Four, so he'd pick it up when he was eight or nine years yeah, old. Yeah, he started playing at a really young age. And was there I, was there any ever, any rivalry like where you're like? Oh, well, probably he's a, he's probably a, normal brothers rivalry. Do you have a brother? No, I have a sister. So we don't, okay, well, sister, we same thing. A, well, we it's only argue rivalry. over who dad hated more. <laughs> that's that's our only rivalry. She literally was explaining to me the other night uh, how much my dad favored me. And I just said, uh, why don't you name me one thing my dad has done for me? Just just one. Yeah. Just name me one thing. And she was like, uh, I'm out. So I was like, all right. <laughs> but that, that's battle. our only rivalry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they liked music. And uh, I think they were a little shocked. That I started playing. I broke my collarbone playing football. My my friend in the dock. Right? My friend said, "You're gonna if you want to get girls, you're gonna have to play football mm-hmm. in junior high." And I was like, "Darn!" <laughs> uh, so okay, let's go down there and we'll go out. And so I ran out for the the coach says, "Let me see what you can do." So I ran out and I mysteriously caught the pass. Then they all piled on me and I broke my collarbone so first day and uh, they sent me home I was at home for three months and my dad said here's play your guitar and stay out of trouble because mm-hmm. he had to work right so that's where it started that's where it started Is maybe how- the injury and the you know, had something to do with it. I heard like boredom is kind of what festers these kind of skills to uh, uh, fosters. Fosters, excuse me, but like, yeah. like foster these skills. Festering, fe- fosters. Fos- festering, fosters. fostering, fostering, fostering the festered these, these foster. skills. Close. skills. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, the, but like you need to be bored to be able to do this. I right? definitely festered. There's no <laughs> goddamn way. It's totally true. All the greats. I mean, I always said if there was, you know, video games and cable and you porn, then we'd have no John Popper. Right. John Popper had to sit bored off his ass playing that harmonica for seven hours a day when he was 11. If he was my kid, he'd be out running around with his Apple Pay, staring at his phone, looking at his 7,000. always stimulated now. Right. Constantly. Boredom. Boredom is an important, or I don't even call it boredom because boredom's sort of up to you, but downtime. Mm. And everyone, every parent is like activities. We need activities. You talk to, you talk to any parent who has like young kids or something, you call them on the weekend. You can hear the soccer game going in the background. I got a seven-year-old that's playing soccer. What's that? 
well, after the soccer, we got to get them all because there's a swim meet and then we're going to the thing and then we're going to collect them. And we decided that it was great parenting to be hustling your kids all over town and filled. You know, their dance card is full, <laughs> right? But meanwhile, where are the great guitar players going to come from? We need some down. You need to be sitting alone with no air conditioning <laughs> and no cable in order to uh, create these these minds. I've just talked to Drew about it the other day. Yeah, if you had a thousand Maybe so, TV yeah. channels, you would have put the guitar over there and started binge watching yeah. something on Netflix. Yeah, I was, you know, I would come home from school and watch Three Stooges. <laughs> right. That was, That's all you that had. Was, that, that was it. No, I, you were four. You know, the, the, um, the thing that was kind of funny is we had nothing. There was nothing. There was no stimulation at all, and I couldn't read. So I had a choice, sit and stare at the wall or stare at the TV. But the TV had a bunch of shows on it that weren't for me. You know, when I was nine, I didn't really much want to watch Bonanza or any of the stuff that was that was being being foisted upon me. But you just sat there and watched it like you're watching Aquarium waiting at a, at a dentist's office. <laughs> you know, just you just looked at it. There was nothing else to do. I should have picked up a guitar. Yeah. I could have been one of the greats. Spe- you could have been. Speaking of uh, it being in your blood, did you find... Uh, and, and along with Stevie, did you find that guitar was easier for you guys? Like, did it just speak to you, and or was or was it just the hard work you put in compared to like all your friends who were trying to play guitar too? Well, I just uh, I I played uh, for about a week, and then I I I learned dun da dun da dun da dun da dun da dun, and I thought this is going to be good. <laughs> you just <laughs> that's when you it was know. like a, a it was like watching Star Trek, you know. Right. And they're taking off on a journey. Well, I, I mean, it had to be in the blood somewhere because because yeah. uh, well, we, we we had uncles that played. So, what about the fi- the physical uh, physicalness of it? Like uh, like Stevie, for instance, he could bend those strings farther than anybody. And uh, it's like the does the finger strength and the and just like the shape of your hands have anything to do with it? I don't think so. I think you have to be the right amount of desperate. <laughs> and then and have the inkling that you are going to be a guitar player or a musician. You know, there's a face popped up in the dock of <laughs> Tex Ritter. Yes. And uh, I don't know if people know this, but that's John Ritter's dad. Do you know that? I didn't know that. Right. Yeah. And I, I took a flight to Miami from L.A. and sat next to John Ritter once. And he just told me his dad was Tex Ritter. His dad was a big country star. And uh, great I, name, yeah, it's great name. He, that's the guy that made Hillbilly Heaven. Yeah, he wrote that. Well, that was one of those Who's in Heaven, like like you wrote that. You wrote a sort of follow up yeah, to it, right? I've got. I wrote a song. Well, I wrote a song with the Neville Brothers that was similar to Hillbilly Heaven. Yeah, the righteous Blues Heaven. The Righteous Brothers did a version. Of rock and roll heaven, did they? Do you I know, that, know one? that one? Oh, no. you're gonna. Oh, you're gonna you know, know it. it. Oh, you know it now, <laughs> Chris. You know it. No. Oh, well, you'll I know probably it. know it. I'd probably I probably know. I think it's the Righteous Brothers. Probably like a early '70s, a little later. Righteous Brothers. I think it's rock and roll heaven. Is it? I'm looking at well, Dawson looking to see that if up. he has it. I do. I want to. You're I wanna, both gonna know this song, by the way, in advance. Yeah, Are you, I'm ready to. I'm ready to be you proven maybe, wrong for once. Maybe, maybe, but Jimmy's gonna know it. Um, well, let's pull that. But I also want to talk about Eric Clapton. I remember hearing that when uh, after Stevie died, you kind of just stopped doing gigs. You would just hang out at your house, play uh, just for like years. You wouldn't. You wouldn't play. You just you just practice at home. Well, alone. it was a couple of years. Yeah, and then Clapton was the one that got because, you back out. Because you know, out. when I would go to the store or I would go anywhere. Somebody would come up and they would, they would go, oh, I'm so sorry, oh. and, and it would be like people crying. Yeah, that's at weird. The store. Yeah. So I, you know. Yeah, but then uh, and then Eric Clapton called you up to play Royal Albert Hall, and that's what brought you back out. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, he claims that he didn't know that. Like, he didn't do it for that reason. He just wanted me to play, and I, I was lucky enough to. I've played with him, and and he liked 
same kind of music. We like the same kind of music. So, yeah. Uh, you got it? They'll do All right. it. Random dates that happen to be exactly yeah. right. I don't know it. I didn't look it up or anything. It felt like mid early 70s. Never heard that one. Well, I never heard that one, but I've, I've certainly heard the Righteous Brothers and uh, uh, still a, a million times, you know, all those other hits that they had when they first came out. And uh, I used to see them on Shindig. <laughs> He's a Texas Roadhouse blues player. He's I get the, the it. I'm from North brothers. Hollywood. Why do I know? I don't know anything about he music. He can name 10 other songs that you've never heard of. Well, uh, that's true, but but did they crack did this song crack the top 10, Dawson? That's I if it's a if it's a deep cut, so be it. But I think that was a I think that was a hit. Became number 3 on Billboard. Number 3 on Billboard. <laughs> what were you doing in 74? Ah, uh, in 74, I was in Austin. Um, not listening to the Righteous Brothers. I was not listening to radio. I was <laughs> listening to BB King, and you know. Yeah. Are you going? Uh, you're going later on uh, today to the uh, Hollywood Bowl. Yes, we're we're, we're going to sit in with uh, Buddy Guy. Wow. At uh, a big hero of mine. The I actually in 2019 I went to Buddy Guy at the Hollywood Bowl and Jimmy opened, and the band said Killer. The sitting in part. As a so, I do comedy, and I I hate. There's no real sitting in 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 comedy. You can walk out and say hi or whatever, but <laughs> there's no sitting in. Right. I get so damn jealous when I hear about <laughs> oh Taylor Swift is in town and she's invited so and so to come up and do a song. Like first, I'm jealous for Taylor Swift because she's getting paid and she doesn't have to do the song. She gets a break, but then I'm. But then the person gets to play to this sold-out SoFi stadium. Yeah. All the sitting in and jamming thing just it sounds like the most marvelous thing in the world. Well, it's, it's great. Any time, uh, any chance to go see Buddy Guy. And it's, tom- it's tonight, right? Well, yesterday's people. <laughs> this is right. last night. But, but you're right. And uh, Adam... You have sat in. You've sat in with Blues Traveler. Oh, that's right. I've sat that's in right. with. Have you heard and of Blues mind. Traveler? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's good. The um, but yeah, like I, what I know you play. The, <laughs> yeah, what was it? I'm vocals, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> Come okay. on, that's my instrument. You're looking at my yeah. instrument. All right. Look All at right. my throat. That's my <laughs> instrument. <laughs> like I know, like Gary Clark Jr. sat in with you when he was 14. Yeah, yeah. He he's a gr- he's a great artist and. Uh, he was, uh, his dad would bring him to uh, Antone's and we'd be playing. And uh, Clifford Antone said, Hey, you got to let this kid sit in. He's really good. And uh, so he got up there. He was 14. He was before he was tall. And he got up there and tore it up. So imagine, like, hey, th- there's this 14 year old here at this bar and you got to let him play with you. Well, I mean, uh, Steve, Stevie was fourteen when he was just cutting records. Like I was doing guitar licks on records. Like it's yeah. So was it I. would piss me off if I was thirty and playing the bass. You know, I'd just be like, <laughs> oh, this sucks. <laughs> like I, I would, I would, I wouldn't. But I mean, I wouldn't like it if I was. What if you were like nineteen? And you thought you're pretty good at basketball, and then 13 year old LeBron James just started dunking on you. Like, yeah. wouldn't you be pissed off? Kid right. barely has a pube, and he's schooling <laughs> me. <laughs> well, that's that's one of those things you can't say anything about. Do do you get like? And, and this guy's great at fourteen. How much better is he at thirty? Or can you tell? Or I mean, you got to be better. Yeah. When you're thirty, but how much better can you be when you're tearing it up when you're? 14. Well, if you're tearing it up when you're 14, how long have you been playing guitar? The maximum is like what? five, six years yeah. max. Yeah, I mean, I started playing when I was 13 and uh, I had gigs. My dad took me to gigs right away. So I don't know. I'm 72. So how, I, I'd have to do the math. How old's Buddy Guy? I don't know. Uh, when you see Buddy Guy, you don't think of. Of an age, you just, you know, wow. Yeah, he's Buddy Guy. <laughs> I've been listen. I've I've had Buddy Guy records since I was thirteen. That's what I'm That's saying. Cool. I mean, yeah. the- and and uh, there was one record that I first got by him. It was called Folk Festival of the Blues. 
You should look it up. It's it, you, anybody go out there and, and buy it. Um, and it was Muddy Waters and all these people uh, at a gig. It was supposed to be live, and some of it was faked. But uh, Chess Records put it on, and and it was uh, Buddy Guy at like seventeen when he first got to Chicago, and uh, he was just wild. Yeah, yeah. 80s, and he's still wild. Do you eighty seven years of age? Amazing. So eighty seven. Well, uh, actually, first off, how's your how's your health? I know you just had a quadruple bypass. It's good. <laughs> yeah, looking good. Oh, showing us wow. a scar right now. Yeah. The yeah. um so the uh as far as like playing for your heroes and with your heroes like I like how weird was it for you when let's say Muddy Waters would come to your show and and sit front row and watch you play? Well, it was um was was kind of scary. It's Muddy Waters. I mean, it's Muddy Waters. Yeah, and he would sit in the front row when I came to Chicago one time, and he brought his. Uh, his wife, who I think, I don't know if they were married yet. She was pretty young. And uh, yes. so he was just maybe taking her out. I uh -huh. don't know. And, um, but, I mean, you know, Muddy Waters is, is Muddy Waters. He's, Does he make himself known? Like, oh, I'm, I'm sitting there. He was there, sitting in just, the front row. He's just sitting right in front of me. <laughs> and so it's, it's very intimidating. Yeah. It's like you can imagine. Yeah, Adam's yeah. performed stand-up for know. Paul McCartney, so he's he's definitely felt the same. Yeah, well, the Paul sat in the very back of the corner of the of the club, so it didn't have that effect of staring. Yeah, of sitting royalty. in front of you, like. Yeah. Mm hmm. All right, we should take a quick break and come back. Jimmy's gonna play, I think, for he has us. His guitar here, right? Yeah. Brought your guitar. Uh, any Righteous Brother song is fine. You pick, <laughs> you pick the one. Uh, we'll take a quick break. Back with Jimmy Vaughn right after this. Simply Safe, squeezing in one last summer getaway. Well, before you get away, don't let the criminals get away with your stuff. Protect your home with the latest innovation from Simply Safe Home Security 24 7 Live Guard Protection. With fast protect monitoring, Simply Safe agents can deter intruders through the smart alarm wireless camera, warning them that they're being recorded and that police are on the way. Voted best home security of 2023 by U.S. News and World Report. We use these guys. We love these guys. Also, you know, when you move, you can just pick up and take the system with you. You can't do it with the hardwired stuff. And right now, my listeners get 20% off any Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Huge offer, limited time. Visit simplysafe.com slash Adam. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam and get that 20% off. AG1. Well, I had mine this morning. Athletic Greens. Love this stuff. Uh, I gave it a try. It's good for gut health, increased energy, immune support, and it tastes great as well. It comes with a nice little scooper and uh, put it right in the shaker cup, shook it up, drank it before I left the house. Even Phil, my dog, helped himself to one of the packets, which is a little nuts, but hey, it's good for him. Better than eating that corn cob he ate the other month. Easy to fit into your lifestyle. It's uh, one of the healthiest things you can do. And you do it in under a minute. Just scoop a powder, mix it with water, do it once a day. I do it every morning. Every scoop is packed with 75 vitamins, minerals, and high-quality whole food sourced ingredients. And my AG1 is delivered every month, so it's super easy to make it part of your daily habit. Also get the single serving size, too, the travel packs. Take those on the road. It's uh, AG1. It's good stuff, and I do it every day. Right, Dawson? If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash ACS. That's athleticgreens.com slash ACS. Check it out. The Adam Carolla Show presents Jimmy Vaughn's birthday cocktail party for March 20th. Let's see who's here. Let's welcome the founder of the Music Teachers National Association, Henry Southwick Perkins. Piano virtuoso, conductor, and composer, Sergei Rachmaninoff. Psychologist, 
B.F. Skinner is here. Carl Reiner is at the party. The inventor of the flight data recorder, the black box, David Warren. Won't you be his neighbor? Fred Rogers is here. Actor Hal Linden. Former San Francisco mayor, Willie Brown. Country singer, the snowman, Jerry Reed. From Emerson Lake and Palmer, drummer, Carl Palmer. Canadian Hockey Hall of Famer, Bobby Orr. William Hurt is here. Spike Lee has joined the party. Holly Hunter just showed up. From Lincoln Park, Chester Bennington. And from Pink Floyd fame, does anybody here remember British popular music singer, Vera Lynn? Jimmy Vaughn is on the Adam Carolla Show. Wow, that's a pretty good roster. Very musical. Very musical, interestingly enough. Yeah, Brothers and Blues is the name of the doc. I recommend it highly. And uh, you can get it where docs are streamed on all the platforms. Um, So I can say that next time that I'm on on the Adam Carolla show, I can say, yeah, I was born on the same day as Rachmaninoff. Yeah, that'll go over real (laughs) well at the Honky Tonks. They'll go, who the the fuck is Rachmaninoff? Uh, Man. ELP, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, they, if, if they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I'm going to physically remove Joan Jett from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and make room. I will take duct tape and put it over Joan Jett's plaque and write Emerson, Lake, and Palmer on, on it, because that is, a, that is an injustice. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, at first glance, not right. in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. All right, well then. Do you pay attention to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Jimmy? Uh, well, we went when they put Stevie in. I went. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, it's. I guess it's nice. <laughs> you know? But you played, right? Did you? Like- yeah, yeah, yeah. We played with a, a lot of people. Uh, John Mayer and was, there was ten, several guitar players up on stage, honoring uh, Stevie's induction. Right. Because they were all influenced. Oh yeah, yeah there'd be sure. no John Mayer without Stevie Ray Vaughan. That's right. Who I used to, I used to assume he was a douchebag, and now I like him. I think he was a douchebag. Oh, maybe he was. Like yeah. Oh, he's like he's had the same trajectory. He's like Jay Moore. Yeah. I think he got former cool. douchebags, and then now they're they're nice. <laughs> See, I tell you, guys get saner and nicer as they get older, <laughs> and women get angrier I'm, and we're, crazier. We're all douchebags at the beginning, right? At the beginning, <laughs> right? But at some point, your douche runs dry. You you you, you life <laughs> squeezes out, yeah. all the douche out of you. When you're 25, <laughs> you're heaping topped off with douche. Yes, but life. Your prostate blows up, life catches up to you, a couple of divorces, whatever, and the douche just, life strangles the douche right out of your bag. And then you're just a douchebag. You're, you're literally just an empty douchebag <laughs> at that point, and at some point, it's, it ends. And that's, yeah. that's, what's, that's what happens. So guys do that. And then women get crazier as time, as time wears on. So that's... that's uh, Jimmy's that's, wife is in the green room. He can't respond. Well, that's why you need the younger wife. When you get <laughs> when you get older and saner, you have to then trade down to the young one because they're not crazy yet. Am I right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I I don't know. <laughs> you uh you consider yourself a COVID non complier. Is that is that correct? Because I kind of consider myself that as yeah, well. I I didn't I I didn't take the. Uh, the vax yeah and you and just, i had covid i got it in new york uh, so you have you feel like you have natural immunity yes i have uh, very much natural immunity yeah i i think covid non-complier i think a lot of people thought you know they would they would hang the label of covid denier and a lot of like stuff denier like Nobody ever said it didn't exist. That's what a denier would would be. Mm. I always said it existed. I just said, I've looked around at this mask, not going to do jack shit. This is insane. Uh, I'm not fat and I'm not old and I'm fine. So it's not a COVID denier. It's just I'm not going to go along with the, with the rituals. 
Yeah. So if you told me walk down the street and walk around the lamppost, every time you pass the lamppost, you got to walk around it five times so you won't get COVID. I wouldn't do that either because it wouldn't affect COVID or make any sense. Now, I looked at the mask, especially when I saw the daylight poking through the side of it from the flight attendant who was yelling at me to pull my mask up and the guy sleeping behind me with the mask around his mouth, but his nose was hanging out. I looked at that exactly the same as walking around a lamppost five times in terms of preventing myself from getting COVID. So not a denier, just not willing to engage in shit that doesn't make sense. Well, of course not. Um, Why would you want to do that? Uh, well, many they did. They got plenty of people that do that. So, the most all I heard at the very beginning was people telling me I did everything right and I got COVID, and I thought that's my ticket to doing nothing because <laughs> you just said you did everything and you got it, and I've done nothing and I didn't get it. So why should I start doing what you're doing because you got it? Yeah. I did that math early. Well, I got it. So how was it? Uh, I was several days laid up, and uh, it was terrible. But you know, were you able to take anything for it? Uh, I think I t- took uh, ivermectin. Oh, so they let you? <laughs> let you? Well, take they didn't ivermectin. let me. I I did. Yeah. yeah, but you had a doctor that that would prescribe it. No, you had to go like I have horses. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So the horse pace <laughs> thing that CNN was talking about. Really? How did it work? I, I, well, I mean, like, I think it's a few days when you get it anyway. So mm-hmm. yeah. no matter what you do. So you took the ivermectin that was for the horses. I don't remember, to be honest. But I have horses and I have ivermectin. Didn't somebody in the doc gift? Did did, did you gift Eric? I mean, who got gifted a horse? Oh, Jackson Brown got yeah, yeah, gifted yeah, yeah. a horse. Did you yeah. see that part? I missed that one. They yeah, but that Jackson was Brown the, got a gift, got a horse gift from. Was it you? No, no, it was what it was from Stevie. Oh, and, Stevie and, got him a the horse. Band. They gave him a horse. For some reason, that's a really involved. I don't gift. know. Like, to, I don't know how you get really? a. Horse. I don't know how you get a horse, but so Stevie gave Jackson Brown a horse, and Jackson Brown was like, "Thank you, but are you going to feed it Thanks. and like take care of it, or <laughs> do I have to do this?" It's, it's not. I you get so in a potted plant, you know that's something. A little yeah. cactus or something. Now you still got to oh, water. Yeah. You got to water it once in a while, mm-hmm. but that's fine. <laughs> and if it dies, it dies. You know what I mean? But the horse. That's a commitment. Yeah. And yeah, he, I don't know where they got the horse. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and they were on the road too, so then maybe they heard about it, you know, and uh, I, don't know. I mean, maybe you know, give Shatner a horse. That guy is horse ready. You know what I mean? Yeah. Jackson Brown's on tour, he lives in LA. I don't he's know what's going to take Roy Rogers a horse. Yeah, I don't know what he I, Jackson Brown was Sort of laughing about it in the dock, but also m- mildly annoyed that he yeah. had to take that someone dropped off a thirteen hundred pound thing that he had to feed <laughs> every day and was going to shit everywhere. I don't know if they if they dropped it off even. I think they just sent it over there or something, but with someone else. I don't know. Uh, but that wasn't there. All all in the yeah the dock. In the dock, you told the story about you. Uh, selling your pedal to Jimi Hendrix right before he went up. Well, well, what happened was I opened for Jimi Hendrix. My band was called The Chessmen, and we opened in Dallas. Um, and, and How old uh, were you? How old was Jimi? I was 14. I don't know how old he was. He was Jimi Hendrix. Age, yeah. Is he, well, how old would Jimi was, Hendrix be today, I guess? He had... He had that that record out. Uh, Are you experienced? Oh, the so album he, that we all know, right? So, uh, and he was Jimi Hendrix. So what can I say? And you know the band was there, and we opened, and uh, he be eighty today. So what happened? It was Saturday. So he's eight. So he eight broke years older. Yeah. The real truth is, he broke 
his Wawa pedal. Mm-hmm. And it was Saturday. The music stores were closed. So the guys came to me. I had a brand new one. And they said, we'll give you 50 bucks. That's twice as much as it costs. And we'll give you his old one. And we, we can take yours and you can go get a new one Monday. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened. Yeah. And I love that. That's what really happened. They asked, yeah, and then they asked you, do you still have the pedal? And you're like, I don't know, maybe. I still have the pedal. <laughs> and I have it in my living room. Oh, nice. Oh, you do. But it's 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 no good for a, as a wah wah pedal. It's just a memento. Of course. Yeah. Do you collect Do you collect That's, guitars? Is that? Something I, that I like I collect guitars that I like. Right. You know that that do something for me. Oh man! If I were flip you, my switch. If I know. were you, like this has to be the greatest experience ever. But I would constantly be hanging around in guitar shops. And people wouldn't, the you know, twenty-two-year-old guy behind the counter might not recognize you, and then you just go get that one. Let me see, see the action in it. <laughs> just tear it up. <laughs> just tear it up. I would never buy a guitar. I would just go in there, tear it up, and go to the next guitar shop. That's that's all yeah, I would just do. Some lines, maybe hidden camera. Right. I'd love to see that, <laughs> Jimmy. When you when you travel for gigs, how many guitars are you bringing with you on the road? Well, I only bring two now. Okay. So, just one I, as a backup. Yeah, if I, if you break a string, you can they can hand you another one while they fix it. So, but as far as collecting guitars, you I like have a to lot play of guitars every at home. guitar that you have, right? I don't know where I live. Yeah, uh, yeah. How, so, how many do you think you have? Uh jeez, I have. You know, I have a couple of. I have guitars since I was fif- fourteen. So. I I have no idea. I probably have two hundred. Do you pay attention to the value of them? Like, do, are any? Uh, well, no. I I um, no, I don't. I mean, what's the jewel in the crown of your guitar collection? That one. The one that's in here. Yes, and uh, I like. See, the, here's the thing with Fenders. I have a. Uh, a lot of Gibson guitars that I, big box guitars, jazz guitars that I like, that are are interesting. Uh, but but when I play a gig, I play a Stratocaster, and it's got a bolt on neck. You can you can uh, it's like a hot rod. Mm-hmm. You can put a different engine in it. You know, you can lower it. You can do this. And you can do all this stuff. Uh, and that's why I love fenders. You can change the frets. You can change the pickup. You can paint it. You know, you can do all kinds of things. But what so, is your most expensive guitar? Like what? I mean, because you hear these stories about guys, you know, back in the day, you get the thing for a couple hundred bucks. It's worth 450000 right. bucks today. Well, I have a 58 Stratocaster. That was my first Stratocaster. That is probably... Worth a lot of money, but I don't. I don't know. I don't. You, you want to play the guitar? You want to? I want to play guitar. I don't want to. You don't want to deal with guitars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. You know. And and, and like I say, it's they're they're uh, F- Stratocasters are like a fifty four Ford. You can you you want to have a f- you, you change the engine and you change the the fender. Oh, you know what I mean? Pond. Are you paying uh, it? Did uh, so? You're going to play for us today? Sure. I'll, I'll, so we'll let you go. Yeah, uh, go grab a strap. Mind your headset over there. Don't get too. Oh, you got it. Oh, okay. He's a pro. Yeah, I guess he's a pro. He's been, he's been doing this. <laughs> well, he's still got to figure out the headset now. Um, so this is a guitar you play. Like you'll be playing yeah, this is at the Hollywood neck, Bowl. A different neck, and this but is Olympic white that I had. So you, you kind of custom built it. Yeah, I mean, you just bolt them together. Yeah, well, I'll still give you credit for the <laughs> custom build. It works. Let's All see right, here. he's putting his headphones back on. This is very difficult. It, it does. It, 
it, it'll create senior moments. Is what I is what I'll say. It's a, okay, uh, you uh, hop up here. Or? It's a those head. Yeah, you could hop or you could stand. Whatever. Those you want. cans are like a they're a young man's game. Let's see. So you want me to do something? Do sure. Something. Yeah. Whatever you like. Let's say you were at Guitar off. Center trying out a new guitar. Yeah, let's just say. And, and, and you know what I would do, too? I would hire a nine-year-old boy, and I would say, this is my grandson. <laughs> he wants to be a rock and roll person, and I, I'd i like to buy him his guitar for his 10th birthday. A rock and roll person. <laughs> and, uh, and then you get it, and you'd go, you'd go, oh, this one feels heavy. Which one? What is this one called again? And then you'd go, let me just test it out. Yeah. And you just rip it up. Okay. That's what I would do. I would film you doing That's that. That's a scenario. So this is the lick you would play at the Guitar Center. Okay, this is uh, a tune that was written by the Neville Brothers sent it to me on a cassette. It came to my house. And uh, so I liked a lot of it, and so I changed it up and made it my own. But they they started it. Mm-hmm. Slack, heaven call another blue string up back home. Lord, they call another blue string up back home. Is up there with muddy and lightning too. Ah, but King and Freddie, they're playing the blues. This T-Bone Walker guitar slim, little son Jackson and Frankie Lee Sims. Another blue string back home. Lord, they call another blue string back home. Another blue string back home. Wow. Woo. It's such a thrill to sit this close to yeah. that that was great so the so the neville brothers sent me the the original alpine valley in the middle of the night mm -hmm. so i made i put it like i was actually thinking about the guy you said hillbilly heaven tex ritter tex ritter so i i tex ritter helped me write the the end of the song because he wrote the hillbilly Heaven version in oh, that. He made know, the it popular. I don't know if he wrote it. Oh, that's a good point. You have to be careful about who wrote versus who, I don't know. who made it popular. Yeah. Man, that was that was righteous, brother. 
That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Please can you can we do a thing where we'd go into the guitar center in like <laughs> Studio City and I'll if get you a kid want, I'll, let's, let's do it. I'll get a kid to play your grandkid and you'll just play like what would be like if you had just a, a crazy riff that was 15 20 seconds long 30 seconds long to play to just stop everyone who was in the guitar center to stop and turn around and look at you what riff would you would you I, play i i i don't know i don't i don't know uh I would just play some blues. No, that's not. It's it's too easy. You need, you need to be crazier, bigger. There's too many guys in that place. Well, that I don't do think that. a lot of people can play that. Yeah, that's a different groove. But they're in the guitar center. I mean, there's got to be some guys. Yeah. So, well, I don't. I don't do uh, that kind of thing where I, I I go in and try to wow everybody with my fast playing and <laughs> just do that <laughs> just do that <laughs> then and don't we'll mic you up <laughs> so uh anyway that's not my thing so what? yeah his, his thing like the chord the chords and the the choices he's making is actually really really interesting as a guitar player that would i would turn my head the way he's playing the blues because you could play i know the blues sounds the same like the 12 bars it sounds the same uh, for a lot of people, but if you're paying attention, like the nuances and the choices he's making, that's interesting. Let's hear a little more, then maybe. Uh, uh, let's see. I, I wrote this song. Now, now I usually play with a band. Oh so, yeah, you don't have to. So, we don't. I don't think we no, have enough no, time no, for the I, whole I song. Do it. But I you can, can do it. All right. Here's a song that I call "Strange Pleasure." <laughs> Is there something that you've been trying to get off your chest that you just you think that through the blues you want to? Hmm. Um, well, I don't like passion fruit iced tea. Yeah, <laughs> that's something I could <laughs> troubles me. Yeah, a lot. If you well, lay, you maybe you lay down a little we get blues. A little bar. You get a nickel, I'll get a dime. We'll go out and buy some pa- uh, non passion fruit iced tea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, lay me down. Can you lay me down a little blues? Just a little blues back, right? like a little bed there for him that he can, Adam can get some things off his chest. Went into the Marie calendars, had a thirst that wouldn't quit, ordered what I thought was standard iced tea, and what they brought me was a glass of shit. No lemon in my life. Now I gotta pee. It ain't right. I got a thirst. Can't be quenched. Now my forehead is drenched. Can't stop sweating. Passion fruit iced tea. Not even gonna get up to take a pee. I'm gonna burn this diner down and move to a better town. Thank you. Passion fruit, iced tea (laughs) blues. There you go. All right, now I'm out of breath, so we gotta wrap it up. Jimmy Vaughn, the great Jimmy Vaughn, Brothers in Blues is... uh, 
And the movie. The I wanted to plug the movie. Oh, the movie. Oh, the the doc. In okay, the movie or doc? The you movie, the doc. Well, there's doc. a there's a premiere that he wants to. Oh, there's a premiere. Get, That's think. yeah. There's a premiere uh, at uh, well, let in, me, Encino. Encino. Look it up. Yeah, I know where that is. Brothers in Blues, at the. Uh, I don't know the name of it. How we'll do you read we'll that? figure this out. Let's see. Uh, first off, you can go to uh, jimmyvon.com for dates and stuff like that. And uh, in theater showings, Los Angeles, September 22nd, uh, Lemley, I think it is, uh, theater in Encino. Yes. The, and, yes. And, it's a uh, weird name, Lemley. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't, and, I wouldn't know it if I didn't know it. And we're going to go out and open for Eric Clapton, and we're going to do Crossroads. In LA this year. That's where? What's Eric's the venue? Festival. Oh, uh, where's where's the Crossroads? Crypto Arena? Oh, awesome! That's uh, the old Staples Center, right? Beautiful, Jimmy Vaughn. Thanks for uh, coming in. That was fun. Thank you. All I right. enjoyed it. We'll take a break. Come back. We got news. We got uh, August. We'll catch you up on August in the uh, draft, and we'll do all that right after this. Let me tell you about microdose. You've probably heard about microdosing. All sorts of people are microdosing daily to feel healthier, to perform better. Our show today is sponsored by Microdose Gummies. Microdose Gummies deliver perfect entry-level doses of THC to help you feel just in the right mood. I think we all know that feeling of being a little past that. And then the I don't feel anything at all feeling, not with microdose. It'll get you right where you want to be so you can enjoy the moment. Microdose is available nationwide. And to learn more about microdosing THC, just go to microdose.com. Use the code ADAM to get free shipping and 30% off of your first order. That's 30% off, but you got to use the code ADAM. Links can be found in the show description. But again, that's microdose.com. Use the code ADAM. Get the 30% savings. That's microdose.com. Code ADAM. Well, good news. It's O Rewards Member Appreciation Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Get the most out of your membership. Shop, earn points, and get rewards sent right to your phone or email. If you're not an O Rewards member yet, sign up. It's quick and it's easy. You can do it online or in the store if you like. Just ask one of their professional parts people about joining O Rewards next time you visit, and you can start earning points on your first purchase. Sign up for both email and tax and get even more out of your membership. And right now, members receive two times, three times, up to eight times O Rewards points on select purchases. Those bonus points can help you get to your next reward even faster. You receive a $5 reward for every 150 O Rewards points, and you can use your reward on your next in-store or online purchase. So don't miss O Rewards Member Appreciation Month now at your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store and O'ReillyAuto.com. I got to think it's the Passion Fruit Blues. <laughs> I don't know, because I, I was a I. You guys thought I just riffed that. That was a cover. <laughs> Righteous Brothers. Uh, Billy Joel. Billy Joel. Yeah. It's a Billy Joel song. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't know that. He was fucking early money on that. Yeah. Um, I would be uh, sleeping with the television on sometimes. If, sometimes a fantasy is it. Is it called Sometimes a Fantasy or is it called Sleeping with the Television? Sometimes on. a Fantasy. Oh, it's called Sometimes a Fantasy. You know that one? 1980. You know, I'm just going to say <laughs> yeah, just, just to avoid it. This <laughs> is Sleeping with the Television on. All right. All right that's a good Billy Joel song. I got to go deep cuts. I'm not going with the shit that you guys are all burnt out on with the radio. But what was the other one I picked? Sometimes a Fantasy. Sometimes. This is all probably off his first or second um, probably circa glass houses. Yeah, 1980, 79. August is on the line. I Mike listen. August. I don't know. See, people they ask me questions. I give them answers. That's all. But listen, everybody. When somebody asks you uh, what artist, you know, what their favorite, don't go with the same four shit songs that everyone fucking knows. Do something a little more interesting. Deeper cuts. I mean, I don't even know Billy Joel stuff, but I know enough to go deeper cut. And when you're doing karaoke, 
get into something interesting. I don't want to hear fucking girls want to just want to have fun again with you and your drunken <laughs> bitch friend. Dig, dig in a little bit. You make Billy, it a little more interesting. Billy Joel does play sometimes a fantasy. Oh, this, he does. This year, it's on a cell. Ooh, all right. But not the not sleeping with the television on. No. All right. Mike August is on uh, the line. Mike. Hello, everybody. Hello. So you were. <laughs> I spoke to you yesterday. You're on your way to the fantasy draft. The once a year fantasy draft with all your favorite folks. You got you got Bill Simmons. You got uh, cousin Sal. Sal. You got all the. You got John Ham. We got everybody. And uh, buddy Kevin Hinch and Tall John and Crazy Brad and a host of other characters. Right. And um, so somebody gets kicked out every year, but it's revealed. And it's been done in very theatrical fashion in the past. I think Dave Damashek was the most recent to get kicked out. Sheck got kicked out last year. That's right, for his trophy uh, malfunction. <laughs> And who won? By John Hamm, I think. So who won this year? This year's winner was Cousin Sal. So oh, boy. he got to pick the person to be thrown out and the method as well. That's right. That's right. That's the province of the winner is you get to kick him out and you get to figure out how to kick him out. So this was Sal's year. So you guys all showed up at what we sort of call the party house, which is... It's a house that's in the middle of the city. That's a very nice house, and you can just very nice house. You can have events there, and I yeah, it was Betty Davis's house in the uh, '30s. Wow, that's how nice a house it was. Yeah, it's it's a mansion in in West Hollywood. You guys, right. just, they just rent it out for events. No, they own it and they use it for events. They use it as a as a well, events. They use it to kick back. You but nobody kind of a, nobody knows who they is. That's the problem. Mm. Well, it's Jimmy and his partners in his production end. So they right. they bought the place. So they have a house. Out. And they they, they cool. throw these great parties there. Events there. Yeah. We've been to what 10 of them. So yeah, yeah there's there's yeah. fantastic events every time. So you guys all show up there. And do you throw someone does someone get removed? Uh, right at the top? Yeah, when you, when you sit down before you, you know, these fantasy things, they all come together, you're going to draft players, right? That's what I do for them every year. I have to read off all <laughs> 250 players one by one and auction them. They bid money, you know, um, to yeah. then who highest bidder gets to put that player on their team. See, so before we start it. I will, but, I got a new answer. Cause I got, I got question in my kitchen, uh, yesterday. Maybe it was Olga or something. It's like, why don't you do fantasy football? I go, because it's lame. I played football. <laughs> I don't want to fantasize about it. And then they go, but Sonny likes, uh, for your son likes yeah, it so much. Why don't you bond? I say, it's stupid. Listen, when he started getting into Pokemon, I told him that was for the gays. Back off. <laughs> and what'd you do? What do you want me to start Literally getting in? has Pokey right in it. Yeah, you want me <laughs> <laughs> Pokey. You want me to start getting into Pokemon? It's another stupid thing. I don't have time for this. Hopefully the kid will grow out of it. Sadly, he's probably going to be chained to fantasy football. I mean, he's definitely, his first marriage is going to end over fantasy football. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. He's, he won't give it up. His wife's going to say, what about me? You're so immersed in fantasy football. And I used to, all I do was give the explanation that it's lame and I don't play fairy tale football, but I got a new answer now. And it's going to be much, it's going to shut everyone up. I don't like the, I don't like the optics of sitting around and bidding on black men in an auction. Oh yeah, I don't sure. like the optics of it. I'm sorry. If you're okay with it, it yeah, seems yeah. to be okay yeah. with you. But for me, the idea that we're having an auction over young fit yep. black men, not going to participate <laughs> in that. Sorry. That's my new. That's my new answer, and and everyone will leave me alone. Nobody will argue with that, and then they'll have to feel bad. Yeah. But anyway, you're having your slave auction over there. But before it began, before it began, I think I sent the video. Chris, you've got the video, yeah, so if we you post it. it up on the site, you can watch. Um, basically, what happens is Sal announces, "Okay, I have I've randomly picked three individuals here who are going to be." Subject to this next challenge, and you know we're gonna we're gonna go with Tall John, Crazy Brad, and Elliot, 
who's Jimmy's, uh, you know, uh, childhood friend who started the league. Elliot right. lives in Vegas. Elliot flies in from Vegas for the auction, right, to mm-hmm. show you how much it means to Elliot. So those are the three chosen. So we have to get up and get out of the kind of the dining room area where we're doing the auction, and we, we're told, everybody back to the pool in the back. So there's a big pool in the back of the house. So we go back, and that's where the video that I shot opens. So Sal is now announcing to the three of them. Right, you want to hear it? We have yeah, it. Uh, I think we have it. Let's watch it. Let's watch it. Oh, you got it. Okay. This- this is the night to get kicked out. It's so much more affordable to get kicked out <laughs> tonight. <laughs> ne- next year is going to be backbreaking, yeah. and yeah. you can't get voted out next year. That's true. Whoever That's right. gets That's voted true. out doesn't have That's to pay right. five or fifty yeah. bucks for two years. That's true. Yeah. All right. So decide between the two of you who's going to be uh, participating. <laughs> yeah. I see a bicycle. We're doing it. There's yeah. a bicycle. All right, well, the three and finalists <laughs> step over here. Okay. And it's very simple from this point on. You just have to race around the pool on this bike. You ready? Yeah, what's the deal? There are three of you. Yeah. Yes. The last one of you to be completely submerged in pool water oh, is out. Out. <laughs> <laughs> the last one. The last one. Get in the pool. The last one. The last one is out. First right. in wins, Brad. All right. All right. Brad. <laughs> Last one. Oh, this is Brad, go. Brad just sits down. Look at Elliot. Jesus Christ. Elliot's taking off his pants, his shirt. Everyone's getting Shoes naked. are off. Yeah. Oh. Wait, he doesn't fit. Tall, <laughs> tall John dives in. It's over. Tall John it's over. and Elliot in. Brad's out. It's over. Brad didn't even it's try. Nine inch pool. Oh, can't fit. <laughs> I'm gonna give you an Uber. Oh, that was not how I thought it would go. I thought Brad would be the first. That one made me sad. Yeah. By the way, no towel. He's wearing the other fucking wire. He's, He's wearing, wearing wire. wire. <laughs> You're after the draft. Soaking wet the rest of the way. All right. All right. No so towel. Brad, um, Brad didn't even want to do it. <laughs> Maybe he can't swim. Something. You know what? I'm... We're not dealing with the same Brad we used to deal with. Brad is a crazy man. He's driven Adam crazy for literally two decades now, right? I mean, it's been two decades of antics from Brad <laughs> at your warehouse, just spilling, well, my slobbering, on the table. Spitting, my problem with tobacco juice. My problem. Last time he got kicked yes. out of the league, I, when we were doing the, 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 the fantasy draft, we used to do the podcast at that bar in, uh, on yeah. Sunset. Remember that I found? Yeah. Upstairs in the back. Yeah. And Brad got kicked out that one year, and not only does he slam dunk a 32-ounce Mountain Dew on, in, right in front of everybody, smashing us all with, with you know, fucking carbonated beverage, he then jumps out the window. There's windows over the parking lot. Second he doesn't go down floor. the stairs when he's kicked out. He leaps off a second-story building to leave the event. My, right? prob- my problem with Brad... <laughs> The problem with Brad is I would host football every single Sunday, and then when I would show up Monday, I would walk where the table was, and my foot would stick to the floor, and my foot would fall out of my shoe. Like I'd have, I'd your have shoe to, would just come right out of the. I'd come right out of my off of shoe, my yeah. foot because Brad would. He did this thing where first off, everyone drinks beer and or some form of liquor. But Brad drinks like Hawaiian punch, extra sticky or whatever. Like he would yeah. buy his beverages based on their adhesion level, <laughs> not even the taste. I've seen him at the market going, what's stickier? Is it grape soda or is it strawberry soda? And the guy would be like, oh, grape soda is a little stickier. Okay. So he would drink this stuff and he would, it would slop all over the place. And he was also the kind of guy who like when you host things – You'll see somebody, I, like, I'd walk into the kitchen of the old shop, and Brad would be standing there holding a slice of pie, like, in his hand, and, like, eating it with the other hand, and underneath him was just pie drippings and shit, and I'd be like, get a fucking plate! Get a plate! I have to clean the shit up! And it'd be like, oh, oh, sorry. You know who else does that, it's weirdly? I don't know who these people are. My stepdad would do that. He would always come over with my mom and he would put out cheese and crackers and like uh, napkins and like some paper plates. And he would pick up a couple of couple of crackers, a couple of cheese, and he'd just hold them and he'd, he'd be eating them while we're talking. I'd just see it and I'd go, he, he, you want a plate, John? He'd be like, oh, I'm, okay. I got, I'm okay. Like, I don't know the people have just like no situational mess awareness like you'll just see someone just standing up eating pretzel sticks or something and there's a big pile underneath this at them. his house 
This is at my house, See, and then later on, my shop for Brad. So every time I'd come Monday morning, it was a sticky, gooey mess that I'd have to this clean up. This explains everything. Brad and your stepfather. He, Brad, is your long lost stepbrother. Mm. This is this is this is you're right. Is. This is you're me. right. So the that, crazy thing about Brad is he would drink the most highly caffeinated beverages in the world, and then always take a two hour nap during football. Yeah, he would fall asleep. <laughs> <asleep. laughs> Dur- during he would, literally, like he would always just okay. Go, he'd announce nap time because we'd sit there for five six hours watching games. Two hours of it, just Brad sleeping on the couch. <laughs> Well, I could see why Elliot, who flew in from Vegas, would just go into that pool. Because what, what's the point of you got to at least go for it now? Right. You made the trip. Um, Brad not even taking his shoes off, not even dipping his toe in the water, already out. Just didn't even want to participate. Yeah. But, you yeah, know, my thing was, you know, it's Tuesday night. Brad's kind of a Saturday night bath guy. Mm-hmm. So I think he looks at it as, eh, it's not even the middle of the week yet. Not what's even bath point? night. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, he. Yeah. Um, now to be Sal, it was it was a very simple challenge. I, yeah. I wasn't it wasn't as no twist twist and plot full of plots as uh, the last one, but yeah. but effective. I asked him. I said, "How did you arrive on these three? Because you got this whole room of people." And he goes, "Well, who else is going to do it? I, it's a room full of multimillionaires. You think Simmons is going to jump in the pool <laughs> to stay in the league, or yeah. Edge, or John Hamm, right. or you, Tony Barbieri? <laughs> you know, all these guys. But you know, they're they're not." Pool guys, but Brad, Tall John's, you know, a, a funny, crazy guy. Elliot, you know, is is a lawyer, and so you know, and for the founder of the league, but he's easily kicked out because he's not, <laughs> you know, part of the crowd now. So that was the three he thought had the most, you know, propensity to want to jump in the pool. But he really thought Brad would be first in. So it was shocking, shocking that he wouldn't. He he tapped out immediately. You saw in the video, he's like, "I'm out. I'm well, not getting in that pool." That's but the, it's consistent in that Brad always keeps you guessing. All right, <laughs> yeah. Mike, we'll talk soon. Well, the soon. best part was hmm. I told you that. Uh, so we go back to the draft and do the draft, and like seventy five minutes later, Sal gets a text, and it's a it's a text from Brad, and it's a picture of ribs, big plate of ribs. So he's like, look, look. So thinking that you know Brad has uh, you know now drowning his sorrows in barbecue, but it's all okay. And Tony Barbieri looks at the pitcher and goes, that's not ribs. That's what's left of his Uber driver. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. We'll talk soon. All right, boys. Thank Happy you. fantasy draft week. Yeah. All right. So my new rap is I'm not comfortable with auctioning off black people to rich white people. That's a good way to get that's out good. of it. Yeah. That's a good way to Olga get Olga can't out. argue with that. I, I mean it. My, my son may be, you, you know, he... Two thirds of his adult life may be involved with fantasy football. He's really into it. He's I'm in into the league it. with him. He needs to inter- Our draft was last night. Needs to be an intervention. Yeah, maybe. I'm thinking. I think maybe the first marriage. <laughs> maybe the second marriage. He meets her at a fantasy draft. Oh, that. So that goes on. Yeah, forever. All right. What do we got Not in the this news? Future. All right. So um, in Greece, mm-hmm. there. Uh, so several bars in a popular Greek party town. Were shut down, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this because this is something you do when Dan Dunn would come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but these bars would collect unfinished drinks and then sell them back to other tourists, according uh, to local reports. But they would have to like funnel them back into the bottle and stuff, right? Yeah, well, they would serve them. They would serve them again to other customers as shots. Oh, as shots. Yeah, but not tell them. Yeah. Um, would, I think I imagine as a customer, you would be buying the drink thinking. So you would have to find glasses. Uh, so you'd have to order like Stoli Neat or something. Like right. Two it's, fingers of Stoli Neat, and then you drink half of it, and then you put the glass down. Right. Yeah. You're not taking somebody's Mai Tai and putting that in. Right. Uh, How much of this could there be? B, because wouldn't there be ice melting? Like most of it would all be scotch on the rocks. Seems right? like a lot of work for not that much return. Yeah, it, it does. But here's the thing: so um, a lot of these bars got in trouble for tax purposes, and also that they're illegally smuggling in their alcohol. Right. So, mm-hmm. so it's already they've worked extra hard to get this alcohol into their bars. I mean, I get the grift where they're taking the. Uh, pop off vodka and putting it into, you know, the Stoli or the 
you know, whatever, yeah, the, the Grey Goose bottle or something, because people fucking can't tell anyway. But <laughs> I was I was having, uh, I went to dinner with Chris Morgan and uh, Fast and Furious Chris, and at some point he was like, <laughs> Chris has the, he does the martini with uh, monkey, I think it's called monkey gin, monkey bar gin or monkey gin or something like okay. that, it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and one oh, all, yeah. what's it called? Monkey gin? Monkey 47. Monkey 47, like super expensive or nice, whatever. Yeah, jeez. Right. So he goes, we'll get the, get the, we'll get the gin, we'll get a gin martini with the monkey gin and, uh, shaking hard, like a lot, real icy, real icy, you know, mm. lot, little pieces of ice in it. And then, uh, one olive and one onion in the skewer and whatever. I go, sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah. I'll take that. So, um, see, here's how you know you're a magnanimous guy. When somebody orders their martini, I'll go, yeah, me too. I don't have my own douchebag take on a martini. <laughs> I just go, I'm not going to do a better martini than him. He's yeah. researched it. And you're you making know? it easier on the bartender. Right. So at some point, we drink the martini. And an uh, hour later, it's time for another martini. But they're out of the monkey gin. So now we got to go. Now we have a discussion. We're out of the monkey. Got to go with the beef eater or whatever. And... I'm sitting there the whole time going, why are you even telling us? Just go <laughs> fucking over there. We're not following you over to the bar. We can't see you. Just go right. do it with the fucking beef eater. No one's going to say anything. No one's saying anything. I anything. bet Chris could tell. He, may, maybe. I, woo, I, the next time. Yeah. Next time we'll try. You, what you should do is next time you go, you order a cheaper gin, and then when he's not looking, switch your drinks and see if he, if he could tell. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna try it, or I'll just tell him. You got to figure out which one's the monkey. But uh, either way, uh, I this is only, there can't be anyone on the planet who would know. I mean, Chris would maybe, but I I don't know how many people would know. So I the bottle switching thing I get this weird shot thing is that's yeah. fucked up. Well, these bars uh, they're closed for two days and fined, and yeah, some investigations still mm-hmm. still being held. But yeah, there's like a lot of weird stuff going on in Greece. Like a, a 22-year-old British police officer was found dead in the streets last week. I See, I don't have a take on Greece. Like, I don't know if they're corrupt and fucked up or, you know, they're not quite Africa, but they're not quite Europe in terms of like, like, you know, you don't hear these stories out of England and you don't hear these stories out of France. I mean, they have murders and stuff, but you don't hear this shit, like the weird shit. And then, and then there's Africa, and you go, and the Middle East, and you go, okay, well, fuck it, all bets are off over there. And then there's Greece. Yeah. I, it doesn't feel totally European, doesn't feel totally non-European. It just feels like they do their thing. own weird shit over yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, so this person uh, was, found, was found dead in the streets. Uh, she died after falling and suffering a head injury, but the chief medical officer said that he smelled alcohol in her breath and questioned how she died just a few hours after arriving in the area. So they're doing toxicology tests on well, her. When you slip and bonk your head, you're surprised when you don't smell alcohol, right? Right. So she had a few pops, blew out a flip-flop on the pop top, like the great Jimmy Buffett would say. <laughs> I I was thinking about Jimmy Buffett the other day, RIP. Has anyone gotten more mileage out of one song? Like, has anyone, oh. in terms of dollars... Who's gotten, who's gotten hotels, it, uh, blenders? It just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, has anybody eaten more of the buffalo off of one song? Like, I've never been a Jimmy Buffett fan. But I don't, I've never really got it. He always seemed like a cool dude. And, like, right. man, like, if you can make people happy, good. But I've never really thought of him as an artist, so to I speak. I never personally got into it. And I never it. really got into it, but it's fine. But that... That one fucking song. Yeah. I'm trying to think of someone else. The, like, who has gotten... There's, there's, I mean, if you could assign a monetary number to what... And you, it'd have to be all stuff. And like, it's, he's got... The Margaritaville's a restaurant. The yeah, Margarita it's hotel Greeks, chains. The, yeah. Um, I mean... The, the closest might be... 
Somewhere along, along the lines of a Sammy Hagar with Cabo Wabo. No, it's but close, that's but not a song. No. no. So yeah, I, I think you're it's like 100% one hundred percent right. One three minute fair to midland song is garnered millions, billions of, of dollars. Now, it's not fair to say, well, oh, you got a hotel because of the song. I mean, he made an investment. You got investors and blah blah blah. But I'm saying if you just took the amount of times he's played that in concert and the amount of stuff that's spun off it. Could you, and you want to know, you know who got, all right, let me tell you this. Hold the phone. Jimmy Buffett did the, uh, made kajillions off the margarita bill, right? Yeah. All right. There's another song. There's another drink song. There's another drink song. Equally as popular, equally as popular about another mixed drink, a very mm-hmm. popular mixed yeah. drink, and Rupert Holmes <laughs> didn't fucking make a nickel <laughs> off true. of that he shit. He didn't capitalize at all. He, there's a pina colada song, and there's a margarita song. They both were equally as popular. They're both you know, fair to Midland kind of you know songs. One guy fucking made so much bank off of his one drink song, and the pina colada guy... Dust in the wind. Yeah. Gone. Pops up on the it's a eight, up on the eighties channel on Sirius XM. That that's it. Rupert Holmes, yeah. no hotels, no concert tours, Just no ordered in Amsterdam at a bar randomly. <laughs> You're right. That's yeah. what you did. To yeah. lot. No, there's no merch, there's no swag. Poor I'll, Rupert Holmes. I yep. think I know why. Hmm. The because Margaritaville is a place. If he put like Pina Colada Town mm. on there or something and made it more. Pina Colada Berg. Yeah, <laughs> right. there you go. Right. Yeah, he should have. He should have put a destination to it. But there, there are two drink songs that came out within four years. Of, I, I mean, Pina Colada. When did those songs come out? Because they're not more than two or three years up. I think a, you're pretty apart, damn close. If not, see, right. Got to be. Escape Pina Colada came out in '79, and. Margaritaville came out in seventy seven. Seventy seven. Oh, two years predated two, it. Two, right on. You're right on the money. Though. I'm a good guess. Now, uh, worst student in North Hollywood High. Now, <laughs> um, I'd like to sit down with Rupert Holmes and go, uh, man. I mean, you outlive the man, so that's a good thing. But in terms of capitalizing, he's probably on, on your drink song. Yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ, and Buffett. I mean. 77, I mean, the guy had a 45, 45, 46 years, 46, just profiting off a shitty song from the 70s. One thing about Margaritaville, and this might blow your mind, it might not, but I only found out last year that the lost shaker of salt Mm -hmm. that Jimmy Buffett is looking Mm -hmm. for is a bag of cocaine. Oh, Oh, really? Yeah. Did not know that. Uh-huh. Number eight on Billboard, Margaritaville and the Pina Colada song. Number one. Number one. Couldn't do a Real goddamn thing. Missed opportunity there with Rupert. it. Rupert, come on. All right. I, I, I just, I'd like to talk to Rupert about it. That's all. He doesn't want to hear it. And you're just going to upset him. Is, uh, is Jimmy Vaughn out of the building? Yeah. Yes. How the fuck didn't he know about that Righteous Brothers song? <laughs> <laughs> the fuck was a fucking top ten hit where they wrote a song about rock and roller radio. heaven. No, somebody but had to, have said. Somebody should have said. Someone something. All the one. connections were there. He wrote for the Righteous Brothers. The Righteous Brothers did this song that he wrote a similar song to the Neville Brothers. Ne- yeah. Okay. The Neville Brothers are the ones that inspired Jimmy. The Righteous Brothers did the other song. He's steeped in in music. Somebody should have raised their hand and went, oh, like the Righteous Brothers, Rock and Roll Heaven. That song from a few years earlier? Yeah. I mean, it's not like he knows any dead guitarists. No. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I don't know what, uh, but it, it's it's like, um, shit. It's like the movie Knocked Up. We're all sitting there trying to come up with a website. Oh, Mr. Skin. Mr. Skin website. Some, somebody should have said, you oh, know, it already. Like Mr. Skin, yeah. Like Mr. Skin, right? This is that with the yeah righteous. Nobody, promise. yeah, nobody said anything to him. Nobody said anything. All right, 
I don't blame <laughs> him. I blame, right? you know, the handlers. Yeah, his crew. His crew. All right. Uh, we got a filmmaker, Brian Sanders, who's uh, got a series about food. Boy, I want to get into what about all this food? stuff. Oh, man. It's, first off, it's, it's bad. People are... People are fat and they have no fucking idea. I mean, it's really, it's a lot. I, I, I'm not a conspiracy guy. You know, I have the tinfoil yarmulke, not the hat, but it starts growing a little every day when you start looking at the food and all the shit like, oh, we'll get into it with yeah. Brian, but there's like a whole like Lunchables. Lunchables is like in in the Heinz family or something. It's John Kerry's married to the Heinz woman. Now they're trying to get Lunchables in schools, the fucking worst thing a kid yeah. could eat. Like, there's a ton of that shit going on. Ugh. All right, Brian Sanders. We'll talk to him right after this. Via tour experiences are what people love most about travel. I mean, God, taking my son fishing in Alaska, that was so amazing. I'll never forget it. Viator. It's a website and app for booking travel experiences, like seeing Stonehenge or a walking tour of Rome. Over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries. Millions of real travelers reviews. So you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. With Viator, there's always flexibility and support with free cancellation, payment options, and 24-7 service. So let's get out there and experience life, shall we? Download the Vitor app now and use the code Vitor10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. One app, over 300,000 travel experiences you won't forget. Do more with Viator. Brian Sanders in studio. Food Lies is the series. It's a six-part series, and uh, there's a pod as well, and we'll get into uh, all of that. Um, mechanical engineering degree from UCLA, which is cool. First job as a designer builder at Disney in Universal Studios. As I, The reason I bring that up is because the only thing I've been thinking about for the last several years when everyone went batshit crazy with COVID is we need engineers we need mechanical people need to build things where your brain gets too fucking soft and malleable you believe everything when you remove yourself from the tangible real world and everyone leaving the farm and going to a college campus has definitely fucked us up we can't think straight anymore yeah well there's actually a lot of engineers in the health world there's some guys that they think outside the box you have this root cause thinking you don't you're not bought into the mainstream health indoctrination mm -hmm. and yeah i think it helps so what's going on in this current day and age and i hear guys like bill maher start talking about fat people and then everyone yells at him and, and he's like that's the easiest way to die dummy like we should be telling people not to be fat and they're like you can't say that and it's like shut up bill that like, was the missed message during the whole completely pandemic completely missed it Fauci never brought it up once. Fucking idiot. <laughs> I posted a lot of Bill Maher clips in the past three and a half years. Oh, really? Actually, yeah, yeah. My audience loves them. I almost got kicked off Instagram and YouTube for talking about this stuff. What? I, what? <laughs> I, I'm going to walk around all day going, I, what are you mad at me for? I'm, I'm care for the kid. The kid is fat. The kid needs to lose weight. Like, why am I the bad person? Why is anyone the bad person? What are we doing? Like, I want to open schools and put kids back in school. Why am I the guy who hates kids? It's fucking upside down world. Well, we're bringing it up in the film. It's kind of controversial territory. We're going against the fat acceptance movement. We're, we have a little section in the beginning saying, Hey, this is not scientifically accurate at all. Right. What is, so what's going on? Why is everyone getting so fat? Well, I think pe most people know the answer, right? The food has well, been tampered with. Can I say two things about that? People know that you're supposed to eat vegetables and exercise and eat protein and stuff like that. What I don't think they're aware of is like, the seed oil that is literally they're putting it in shampoo now <laughs> and toothpaste. Like, I don't think the average person knows how much of that oil they're sucking up everywhere all day in every venue. You're right. It's the number one thing that has gone up in our diet. It's perfect correlation with all the disease and obesity. 
I think, yeah, people have the wrong info. So I, I shouldn't say that people do know what's up or I wouldn't have to make this film series. People think they need to just eat fewer calories, jog more, eat more salads. I mean, those are all fine, right? But that's not really something that's going to make the progress that they need. It, it'll help, but they need to know the opposite of what we're told. Eat more meat, maybe. Eat more eggs. Don't be, don't be scared of red meat. Yeah, avoid seed oils. Uh, maybe you don't have to have giant salads every day. Well, the, the seed oil thing is insidious. I brought it up a lot here. I mean, I just at my own home, I, there was some big spray, pan spray that had a big picture of an avocado on it. And it was, read the labels like on the backs, like canola oils first, avocado was like last. Like <laughs> they are fucking with us with this. And, and what people don't understand is you go to a restaurant and you think you're going to make a healthy choice by ordering a salad. I guarantee the salad dressing mm -hmm. has seed oil in it. Is, unless you brought your own, that shit's got seed oil. And so you're making this healthy choice, but you're slathering it in all this seed oil. Yeah. And they cook the steaks in it, too. The, most of the time. It's every. It's it's everywhere. It's it's nuts. And, and, and everyone just keeps getting fatter. And nobody can really unlock the, the I don't know, is there is this big government, big seed, big safflower? Like, who's <laughs> oh, who's doing this? Oh, well, I learned the hard way. So I tried to start my own company. I started a grass-fed meat company called Nose to Tail. We don't make any money, right? We're trying to sell just whole foods, just meat. And then I realized that the profits in the processing, like you can have, what's crazy, you can have a, a list of 10 ingredients. So you're putting more ingredients in something, yet it costs less and you're making more money. So all these companies, they're making a box of cereal. It's like 20 cents for right. it, I, the cereal. The box probably costs more than cereal. And then they sell it for $5. They're making so much money times a billion of these. They can do the lobbying. They can fund the fake studies that says it's healthy. And they can do all the marketing. So it's all we see. And then there's you know a lettuce company. They're not making any money. A right. meat company, they're not making any money. Right. They can't. I mean, first off, we can't even get our shit together for school lunches. Like w the school lunches are shitty, unhealthy slop. It's nuts. And I don't know what that, someone can run down that Lunchables story, but I think it's a John Kerry wife Heinz cor it's corporation just, it's thing. It's weird but, that the, like processing though, adding all these processes to food actually makes it cheaper. Like I hear like, like fast food restaurants, they make huh. a lot of their money, probably most of their money from soda. It's really? Just, yeah, because it's so cheap for them. To, to buy just the soda, the soda syrup, and then right. and just add water. Yeah. 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 And then they fill every, they fill up, the, you know, ice goes to the top of the cup, <laughs> so there's barely any soda in there in the first place. Not only are you not going to get the, the information you need from the government, the government will actively go after people who are accurate, and you will stand back and applaud that. Don't do it. Understand when someone's being deplatformed, that's your first reason to go find out what they're saying. In every subject now, the food pyramid was wrong for my entire life. Still wrong. It's yeah, that, that's what we're fighting against. But so there's there's half of it people do know. People kind of know Twinkies and Twix bars are not good. Right. But there's a whole nother level that they don't know. And it's what you're saying. They're, they're not going to tell you. You have to go find this out on your own. So I don't blame people. Because they're just like, I don't know. Yeah, I got a salad at a restaurant and I ate the like healthy frozen dinner that said it was healthy. So they, some of it is they just don't know. And it's also people are God, caveman dumb when it comes to a lot of stuff. Like they'll go, especially chicks do this all the time. They go, I know what works for me. I know what my body needs. And I'll fuck off your fucking body. <laughs> You're just a slug on this fucking planet. It's going to be in the ground in 10 minutes and no one's going to care. Your body, your body's the same as everyone's body. Put the right shit in it. Don't give me the, I know it works for me bullshit. That's a good one. Everyone's like, oh, well, I'm doing it for my blood type. Or like, well, I'm this person. We're all homo sapiens. Yes. Generally, 99% of the time, we are the same. And any diet that can work for, you know, a human appropriate diet will work for anyone. And I actually went to Africa for this film series and spent some time with the hunter gatherers. And that was pretty crazy because, well, of course, they don't have any of this food out there. Yeah. What a, um, you never see any fat guys over there either. <laughs> Those are the ones that die quickly. Well, you know, you, you, you sort of think about it, like what's so different? You know, there was no fat kids in my 
junior high, you know, or there's always one fat kid because you need one fat kid. Everyone needs one fat kid. When I was growing up, you had to have one fat kid and one kid with a leg that was shorter than the other. And he wore like the weird shoe with that uh, extra heel sole. on it. Yeah. And that, that you, they were all, each school had one. If a school had two and one school didn't have one, they'd have to ship the, the kid off to the school. That's even it out, yeah. Yeah, but maybe that school had two fat kids so they could trade them for the kid with the short mm -hmm. leg. But that's all there was. And then you go, well, back then people ran around. They got more exercise. They still, McDonald's was around and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, but they weren't all fucking fat like they are now. And this is, and kids still run around and McDonald's is still around. So what's really going on? What changed? People say, oh, you just need to exercise more. I'm like, people are still exercising. There's more gyms than ever. People are doing more purposeful exercise than ever. It's not genetics. We have the same genetics. Genetics don't change in a couple generations. It's really just what people are eating. Right. And it's what they're eating. But like I said, I ate fast food when I was a kid, but it wasn't the same fast food as kids are eating now. I mean, they figure out more ingredients every year to put in those. There's like 17 ingredients in French fries or something ridiculous in McDonald's. What? So what is, what is the best way to avoid? Like, I have little tips for people. Mm -hmm. This is basic stuff. Don't buy shit in plastic. Everyone buys the fucking squeeze mayonnaise or the squeeze ketchup. I was like, get it in glass. Mm -hmm. Get it in glass. You have a much higher shot of that thing being better mm -hmm. that's in there just from switching. Fuck plastic, by the way. Same thing. It's just like booze. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Stay away. Stay away from anything that comes in plastic. It will be the cheapest version of whatever this thing is. And then you're going to have to start reading labels. And by the way, the big picture of the avocado on the front label doesn't mean shit anymore. <laughs> you got to turn that jar around and read it. Do the work. Yeah. 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 So those are that's huge. Yeah. Doing the small things are big, but the big things are better. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I got really obsessed with this. I had this whole 10-year journey and figuring this stuff out and six years making this series and talked to a couple hundred scientists, doctors. And the biggest thing I found is actually the, the protein, the nutrients versus the energy, right? Carbs, fats, that's energy. Mm -hmm. right? So there's so many things. Yeah, you could avoid plastics. That's great. Like avoid sugar. Like there's a million little things you can do. But the biggest thing you can do is look at this nutrient to energy ratio of your diet. And it sounds like kind of weird because people don't know about food and you have to think a little more. But the way to not think is just, well, let's double up on the eggs. Let's double up on the, the meat. Let's double up on fish. And let's cut out just the bread, pasta, the, the whole base of the food pyramid. That's kind of just empty calories. Like my grandma would tell me that. You know, your mom tells you that. It's like, don't eat empty calories. Right. That's actually big. That's actually the biggest thing that I found. That is... So food is, your body doesn't care what diet you eat, right? It doesn't know what paleo is. It doesn't know what keto is. Mm -hmm. It just knows it needs nutrients. You need protein, vitamins, minerals, stuff like that. And mm -hmm. you need energy to get through the day, mm -hmm. right? And for all of history, that worked because we ate the right foods and they gave us the right amount of nutrients and the right amount of energy. Now, everyone is short on protein, short on vitamins and minerals, and they're long on energy. They're eating that's the seed oils coming. They're just stuffed in everything. Added sugar, stuffed in everything. Corn syrup, stuffed in everything refined grains, right? So this is just diluting our food. So it's like, if you focus on one thing, you have to focus on, okay, how am I going to get more of the protein, more of the nutrients, and less of the extra calories, empty calories, right? Huge difference between nutrient calories and energy calories, mm -hmm. right? The whole thing, one of the biggest food lies is, oh, calories are the same, right? They're just like, oh, reduce your calories and exercise more. That doesn't really help anyone. If it was going to help anyone, we wouldn't be in this mess. We need to differentiate between the good calories and nutrients, protein, stuff like that, and the energy. And if you do that, then yes, then you can get to the next level and get rid of plastics 100%. Then you can get into your blue blocking glasses and you can do all the biohacking stuff. But people need to start at the top. Well, I think like a common thing, at least in days of yore, would be like, well, I'm not going to have eggs for breakfast. I'm going to, I'm going to go healthy. So I'm going to have some wheat toast and put some margarine on it. I don't want the butter. I don't want the animal fat, you know, so I'm trying to be healthy. You know what I mean? And then you're eating something that's unhealthy and you're suffering <laughs> because in the name of health, you're avoiding the thing that's better for you. Breakfast food is a great example. Cereal, corn juice, toast, jam, bagels, all that empty terrible a, trash oh, orange juice has more sugar in it than a coke worthless it's worthless it's it, with every single picture 
of every breakfast cereal from every commercial I've ever seen as a kid has a big glass of orange juice yeah. <laughs> right, right next to it. <laughs> but that's the whole point. I know people who like drink orange juice because they would never drink a Pepsi for breakfast, but they think they're taking some healthy route. I will tell you this, everyone. If it's in a liquid form and it tastes good, it's bad for you. It's just it, all the smoothies with the bananas and the papayas and everything. It's all bad. It's it's If it tastes good, it's bad. Unless it's sort of acquired taste shit. Like, you know, with... You know, uh, black coffee, maybe. Yeah, black coffee. Oh. Or maybe it's a you know vodka soda water with lemon or something like that. Where it's like a kid. If a kid would drink... Here's the rule. If a kid would drink it, don't drink it. Because a kid won't drink black coffee and won't have, you know, black tea or the vodka soda water with the lemon or whatever. If the kid, if the kid will spit it out, you spit it out. Well, that's the, exactly the empty calories thing. The, the right. worst thing you can do is drink calories. There's this whole satiety thing, too. And it also goes with your point about you're, you're punishing yourself and then it's backfiring. You, you eat a salad. Oh, I'm going to eat a salad with no dressing and like a little bit of turkey like this big. You're starving two hours later and you're eating something worse. So... Losing weight, losing fat specifically, is a batter, battle of hunger, right? It's a ba- you, you don't want to eat too much. And you need to set yourself up su- for success with eggs, meat, you know, these nutrient-dense foods that keep you full. So what's the opposite of that? A soda, orange juice. No one's like, oh, man, I had uh, orange juice nine hours ago. I'm stuffed. Right. We don't know. The fuck? We've been arguing over an egg my entire adult life. Mm-hmm. My, you know, you know, high cholesterol. Get rid of the yolk. You know, you should be eating egg whites. You know. We're nuts. Eggs about the best thing you can eat, oh, right? I was just saying that eggs a perfect food. It can make a whole chicken. It's got it all. It's got it all. <laughs> and we're arguing about it. The the last time I went out to um I went out to breakfast with my daughter and um I ordered a I built my own omelet. I built it myself. Mm-hmm. And with these two hands, I love, <laughs> we're all such fuck ups now. He left out the fucking Sauce. He fucked up the omelet. You want to know unsatisfying? Here's unsatisfying. Go. I build my own omelet, right? And the guy goes, you want the egg whites? You want the egg beaters? They're pushing it. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. I go, no, just regular eggs. I go, give me onion, spinach, cheddar cheese, and chopped up link sausages. Okay. It's okay. Wait there. Comes back. It's got everything. But the fucking sausage. If he would have forgot the spinach, I could have fucking got through it. So I go, all right, now I got this fucking whole omelet I waited a half hour for. Got no (laughs) sausage in it. This is my second omelet situation. People are too dense. They're too dumb now. They can't figure it out. So I go, "Uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, there's no... First of all, it took me 10 minutes to dig through it to figure out it wasn't buried in there somewhere. And he goes... Uh, I go, there's no sausage in this omelet. And he goes, oh, okay, yeah, let me get that. And he goes to the kitchen, he comes back with a plate of chopped up sausage, and I set it on top of my omelet. Not oh, not a great not, same. not a great experience, but he asked me if I wanted the egg beaters. <laughs> Why are we still pushing these things? The, the eggs is a great example. I'm going to give you a little nod here. The stupider liar. Mm. Stupider liar. So I'll tell you a quick story. With eggs well, in yeah, our so society. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, my brother downloaded 1,000 hours of Loveline for me 12 years ago. Wow. And I, when I was working as a mechanical engineer, I was a little monkey back there doing, building some things on the computer, listening to that forever. Amazing. You formed some of my thinking. I think it helped me. Mm. Like, Yeah, yeah, it was good. That's why people don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little Corolla. In me. No, I had to move out. I had to move to Texas because people didn't like me here. I had, yes. to, I had to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, you think like me. You could <laughs> run out of town. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, stupid or liar? Meat is bad. Eggs are bad. Are you stupid or are you a liar? Like these, these government organizations, USDA, all these people. Stupid or liar? I posted about actually. I, I shouted you out a week ago. Stupid or liar? I'm starting... I used to go stupid and now I go liar. Like I used to not think that, you know, Rochelle Walensky from the CDC or, or, or whoever's in head of the WHO or, or Fauci or any of these people, they're all looking at everyone straight in the face going, this virus didn't come from a lab. No way. <laughs> and a few years ago, I would have went, oh, well, maybe he was just off or he's wrong. Now he's lying. 
now everyone is lying. And I, I don't, I don't know why everyone is lying about everything. There's usually some profit to be made at some point. You can kind of follow the money with everything, but now everyone is just lying. It's, 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 it's it's insane. Ugh. Anyway. That's why I left as well. Oh, I, I had to escape. Yeah, it's so fucked up. I know. No follow up questions. It's not just food that's lying. Uh, well, lying it's everyone everyone is lying. Well, that's Every, what I everyone's think. Everyone's lying now. The last three and a half years, it woke me up. I mean, they kind of overplayed their hand here. Where before, I'm just like, oh, the food system's a mess. Sick care is a mess. But that's it. And then I realize, oh no, everything is a lie. But why? What I don't. What, what benefit is it for your son to be fat? Or your daughter to be fat. Like, what do you? What's your good. beef with Bill Maher? <laughs> you got a fat kid who's unhealthy. Lizzo is unhealthy. Like these, it's it's unhealthy to be this way. Aren't we on the side of health and kids? Why is this shameful? I mean, I listen. Ten years ago, when I started railing about make your own kids breakfast, you feed your kids, you make them breakfast, and what? Oh, HuffPo had a fucking field day. Young the Turks. Young Turks yeah. and all Adam doesn't want kids to eat. Why are you guys taking the side? You want the kid to go to the fucking school, which is basically prison food, and be fucking slopped? Is that what you want, Young Turks, or you want CNN? Like, why do you want this? Why am I? What? What the fuck is? What does Bill Maher and me have to do with this? That's what I don't. I don't get what all these people are, or even COVID or whatever. Like, wh- why do you just pick the wrong side of everything and then attack everyone who's looking for some form of solution? I don't. I mean, I guess everything's political. I I don't know what it is. I read 1984 again. Oh, it's happening. Like slavery is freedom, war is peace. I don't know. I, I'm not a conspiracy guy necessarily, but when everything is backwards, then, you know, are they tr- like, what's going on? But whether it's COVID or whatever, politics or diet, what the fuck's wrong with the individuals? Why can't people wake up? I, I was shouting at everyone to wake up during COVID for three years and everyone yelled at me. Like, why can't you do a little fucking research on shit? W- whether it's canola oil or, or COVID. Yeah. Look it up. Figure it out. You've been talking about this for decades, the individual responsibility. And I think there is sort of this campaign against people taking individual responsibility. Yes. That's the overall theme. It's like they don't want it. Like, oh, just rely on us. Just we'll take care of you. The government in the last 10 minutes has expanded at an incredible rate. And they just keep wanting to grow. And everyone just kind of goes along with it, but they shouldn't be going along with it because what you have is what we just experienced with this crazy like overreach. And they've also seemed to become like sort of fanatical about about everything. And it's a weird time. I don't, I don't know what it'd be like if I was like 13, <laughs> what, I'd, what I'd fucking think. There was like a music video with Fauci. They were like singing about him. He was like the hero. <laughs> they had candles for him and, you know, it was like St. Fauci candles and, and everything. It's really, it's really nuts. Uh, so you shouldn't trust the food pyramid. You shouldn't trust Fauci. You shouldn't trust anybody from the WHO or Pfizer or whoever, CDC. Um, certainly don't trust anybody in hollywood any message they have any advice do not believe anyone who's in any position of power in hollywood about any subject because they're all fighting to keep their jobs and the way to keep your jobs you have to lie now bill maher has f me money that's why he says what he wants he's never been married he has no kids he's 68 years old he's got 50 million bucks in the bank and he's like Fuck it. Yeah. I have a little something called dignity. So fuck you guys. I'm not going along with your bullshit on everything. And you can't cancel me because I'll just do a podcast and live shows if, if you do. So listen to those people. Do not listen to anyone who's trying to keep a job. Anyone who's trying to keep their job or running for election, do not listen to. There's a, there's a small group of people that just reject it all. And a lot of them are gathering in Austin where I live now. And I had this joke that there's just going to be, we're going to have our own community someday. 
and everyone's going to be fit and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to be pale. We, we, do, we are not scared of the sun. We are healthy. We're strong. And then the tour bus is going to show up and they're going to have the rascal scooters. This is like 60, you know, hundred years from now. They're like, who are these humans? Oh, well, I'll, tell you, what, I'll tell you what's going to happen before that. Uh, everyone from California and all the people that are the societies that are dying on the vine are going to show up and go, we need some money. <laughs> I know you guys like to work and stay fit and everything. <laughs> we don't, uh, but we need you to, uh, we declared ourselves a sanctuary city. But we got nowhere to put anyone. So uh, we need you to kick some, some money back. California is nuts. Did, did they try? Cause I've talked to uh, attorney Mark Garagos on this. Hmm. It's like, uh, you think you're moving out of California and moving to Nevada or Texas or somewhere? Florida, uh, you can't leave a fucking dog house behind. Yeah. They'll go, no, 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 no. We need, they're, they're literally, all their energies invested on trying to get people to pay taxes after they leave yeah. because they're leaving. None of their energy is making a more hospitable place to live for the businesses that yeah. are leaving. It's all, all the energy is trying to get money from people who are trying to leave. That's a weird, it's a kind of interesting way to govern, right? It's yeah, it's it's not it's a backwards business plan. <laughs> yeah, you should go, whoa, wait a minute, why is everyone leaving? Oh, maybe we should maybe there's a course correction to be had. We, here. Them, we gotta get as much we as we can. We squeeze them before they leave, we'll meet them at the Nevada border. <laughs> no one wants to look the internalizing. You always made fun of Drew for, for internalizing things. No one wants to internalize and look at themselves first. Yeah, well, I don't I don't know. I mean, don't get me started on Newsom, but I mean, he he was asked. We always play it, you know. Yeah. People are leaving. Where are you going to go? <laughs> okay, I don't know. People are living, leaving. But yeah, it, it, and what what uh, Brian was saying too. It's just yeah. I and like as far as fat shaming goes, we just don't want to hear it. So mm -hmm. we ignore it. We, we're in denial almost that it's well, even happening. We're but we're we're also living in some nether gray world of when stories come up, like remember, remember it was a big deal three weeks ago when uh, Florida had uh, done their history books to mention oh, yeah. that slavery and some slave learned trades and some of them would take the trades while they were enslaved and then when it became free, they would become blacksmiths or whatever, mm -hmm. thatchers, roofers. Um, and, and everyone was outraged. Oh, by the way, they're never outraged because 10 minutes goes by and they stop talking about it. Right. You know what I mean? Like AOC's mm -hmm. taking pictures down at the border, crying next to a fence in a parking lot because of the kids in cages. Now we have 10 times as many kids in cages. She's not going to the border. Well, does she care or doesn't she care? She, already, she, doesn't, she was already there. She, she got care. the photo. Nobody <laughs> cares about any of this stuff. But uh, so my thing is, and call me nuts, but here's the part where we're, we're all leaving the world in some bizarre space, which is, my thing is, is look, either slaves learned a trade, some of them, and they did it after they were slaves and they were free, or they didn't. If they did, then put it in the book, because we're writing a fucking history book about what happened in this chapter called slavery. So if this happened, then fine. Right. Yeah, in 20 years, we're not well, going to believe any of our history. What books. are we arguing over? I mean, we're arguing, it's like, is the guy wrote it racist? Or DeSantis said slavery was a good thing, which I always love when they do that. But I'm just saying, did it happen or didn't it happen? Because if it did happen, then we got to put it in the book. That's what I'm saying. The personal truth is outweighing I, the truth. I, no one even got to that part of the argument. We were totally arguing over whether DeSantis was racist or not. But no one ever said, did it happen? Doesn't matter. It's a history book. Doesn't 1984, matter. 1984. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, is the Edmund Fitzgerald still a barge in, in Lake Michigan, or did it sink? Because if it sunk, put it in the fucking book. Because it's something that happened. I know who, show, well, who, show we have pick new winners for the Civil War or World War II or World War One. I? I mean, should we, we just, we're going to reshape? I can see how many slaves each of them are. Everything? We'll, is, we'll that, is that the new world order? I uh, Listen, I'm fine with it. I'm just not fine with people. <laughs> you just got to find people that don't accept this narrative. I'm telling you. They're, they're weirdly, they're the lot of, the, the people who are very inquisitive about it are super inquisitive about it. And then there's everyone else who's just like, they get like, 
annoyed by it or something like that. I, I we don't, don't like know. inquisitive I don't, I don't people. Know. You know, they're just like, just, just, just put the mask on, <laughs> would you? What's with yeah. the que-? There was like, what's with the questions? You know what I mean? I get the, what's with all the complaints and the questions? I go, well, what do you think I do for a living? Tune harps? <laughs> that's all I do is fucking complain. That's, 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 my, that's my job. Well, science, that's what qu- science is, is questioning. Well, you can't question the science, though. And, <laughs> and as, as Fauci announced, he is science. Mm. Fauci announced mm. he's science. And you're then not, you you're can't. You're not disagreeing with him. You're disagreeing with science. <laughs> right, right. So he's science. But science disagrees with science. You're right. That's, right, right. Science. That's like how it but goes. Now you're dis- but, but Fauci's anointed himself science. And you're disagreeing with science, so thus you can't disagree with Fauci. Smart That's strategy. It's a. Cr- <laughs> like you can self-proclaim yeah. science. I should just say I'm the food god, and everyone has to listen to me. Right. Yeah. Well, that would be a fair bit better than everyone <laughs> listening to Fauci. Yeah. Thank you, food god. Yeah. Thank you, food god, for this offering. <laughs> yeah. There's a clip somewhere, but it's yeah. You're not disagreeing. Fauci said you're not disagreeing with him. You're disagreeing with science, uh, and he is science. Um, so where do we find this six part? Oh, it's not series? out yet. We got the intro. It took us quite a long time. You might want to cue it up. I, I gave it to Ben. It's a quick intro about what we're doing. Hundreds of shots that we made by hand. I know you're a doc guy. It's been a whole journey trying to make this because it's just me and a guy trying to do it on our own. In with, Africa and everywhere else. Everywhere else. We're trying to do it on our own. I mean, we have a graphic artist, but it is... Uh, uphill battle to do this we have uh we might not have a full 330 but maybe we'll play the first minute of it and then we'll tell people where to see it looks how great how did i end up here well it's a long story but for now i'll just say i'm right and this is my film but wait let's back up a bit before food lies even began I didn't just wake up, quit my well-paying engineering job, and decide to make a food documentary. You see, eight years ago, I got the two worst phone calls of my life. First, my mom told me that she'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which, just a reminder, has no known cure. So just like that, my world shattered. Then a few months later, my dad calls. Turns out he has stage two cancer. Once again, shards. I wish I could tell you they beat it, but like most, they didn't. Dad's gone, and mom could go any day now. I went through all five stages of grief, but after that came a sixth emotion, fear. To avoid the same fate, I thought I need to live a healthier lifestyle. But then I realized my parents were basically poster children for conventional health advice. They didn't smoke or drink, they exercised, and got eight hours of sleep. And when it came to diet, they did exactly what Uncle Sam told them. Plenty of heart-healthy whole grains, fresh fruits and veggies, low-fat everything, and of course, they avoided red meat like the plague. Then I thought, there must be more to it. So I dug deeper into healthy living. The doctors agreed on most things. Avoid tobacco and alcohol, get sleep and exercise. But then I looked into diet and holy crap. If you think politics is a minefield, nutrition is nuclear. None of the doctors or scientists could agree on anything. As soon as I found an article supporting one diet, I'd find another saying the exact opposite. Low fat, high fat, no meat, all meat, screw that, eat nothing but potatoes. How could the smartest species that's ever lived be so clueless about what to eat? Even bacteria can figure that out. So that's how it started, a six year long exhaustive journey. I interviewed over 200 nutritionists, biologists, archeologists, and every other ist you can imagine. I even started a top five nutrition podcast that's downloaded in over 145 countries. It sucked up every last minute and nickel I had, but it was worth it. Because here's what I figured out. The history of how we got here is insanely complicated, but the answers are pretty darn simple. Lifelong health isn't hidden inside a magic berry from the Amazon. It doesn't come from chugging apple cider vinegar or doing a $500 juice cleanse. You don't need mountains of money, tons of time, or rigid discipline. You just need to know the right information, the truth. And the truth is, they got it wrong. Not just a little wrong, but wrong wrong. Eating the right food is about more than just getting shiny new abs and fitting into your wedding dress. The right nutrition can save your life. We're spending trillions in healthcare treating chronic disease when the best medicine could be right on your plate. Unlike other documentaries you might have seen, I didn't make this because I had an agenda. I made it because I had questions. Like, how did we become a nation plagued by obesity and chronic illness? How do we figure out what to eat when the people in charge don't have a clue? We need to hit every side. The fossil records, anecdotes, genetics, clinical trials. We'll look back at the dawn of humanity 
and stop at every screw up, mistake, and milestone that led us here. And even though there's no one diet to rule them all, there's a framework that can guide anyone. There really is a way of eating that's healthy, sustainable, even ethical, and it's precisely the opposite of what you've been told. It's a great looking trailer. Thank you. you. Wonderful job shooting it. Yeah, at the top of that, did you just search for a Bob O'Reilly <laughs> sound alike? Because uh, that was yeah, Bob O'Reilly, but yeah. that we was have not a composer. Bob yeah, we have a custom composer. We're doing this right. Yeah, that's why it's taking so long. We we got a composer. We got an amazing graphic artist. We made each one of those shots by hand. It was there's. Amazing. It looks amazing. There's sound alikes, and then there's feel alikes when you make doc. <laughs> I don't know if that's a sound alike or feel alike. It was both. It was both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, I was watching an NFL preseason game. Imagine this. And one of, you know, they do that thing, you know, in between the quarters. I wasn't a commercial break or something. It's just like the offense is getting off the field and the defense is coming on. And they're like, uh, this, uh, this quarter brought to you by the, the, some gastric bypass surgery company, <laughs> like literally <laughs> advertising a stomach shrinking surgery. In the in the middle of a preseason football game, like kind, kind of shit weird. would be unthinkable in the past. That's there's like a, an idiocracy. Yeah, there's a billboard uh, three blocks from here that's been up for a long time, and it just says "Eat anything you want," and it's a gastric bypass, <laughs> whatever. And Ugh. but listen, the problem is, is like Ozempic came out. And I would hear people go like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to get on that. Then I don't have to fucking deal with it. And I'm like, you have no idea what you're doing and where this is going and what. There's no free lunches in nature. There is. It doesn't exist. It's a great. <laughs> that's the great Dr. Drew. Doesn't said a lot of bright things in his life, but the brightest thing he ever just went, no free lunches. You can't. No free lunches. You can't take a pill. And oh, I mean, you can and it'll work for 10 minutes mm. or something. But yeah. there will, nature wins. Believe so, you me. That's how it works. All right. Let me give the uh, website out. Foodlies.org is where you can go and you can pre order the series and learn more about it. And uh, Brian is, you know, the, Brian, uh, unlike the aforementioned politicians or heads of the CDC <laughs> or everyone in fucking changes or whoever's Swalwell on CNN, everyone changing their story every 10 minutes. Motivation, motivated by passion and to do good, not pharma or Nabisco. Right. And just genu- genuinely curious. Genuinely and, curious. Yeah. All right. Uh, Blue Note, Honolulu. I'll be doing a show there uh, this Friday. I think two shows, so come on out and say hi. Uh, go to amcrow.com for all the live shows. Brothers and Blues, that's the Jimmy Vaughn um, doc that you can enjoy. And uh, Food Lies as well. So, until next time, Adam Kroll for Brian Sanders and Jimmy Vaughn and Chris Max Pattis saying Mahalo. Mahalo.